All right, so um, let me begin the, with the sort of the, the, the pairing of massive data set, uh, data sets with uh, processes that we call algorithms and processes written in computer code to sort through, organize, extract, or mine these data sets. Um, that process has made inroads, of course, as you know, in almost every major social institution. Today, techniques of mathematical optimization are routinely implemented across domains as varied as education, medicine, credit, insurance, criminal justice, and the public sphere, just to name a few. And all of that is happening in an effort to streamline and automatize processes of risk prediction, resource allocation, communication, and decision-making. These techniques, of course, are reorganizing markets they are reorganizing the state and they are reorganizing society at large. Now in the sphere of the market, what we see is the creation of new classifications and new forms of capital that structure people's life chances. In the sphere of the state, um, these uh, techniques transform the conditions of citizenship and political identification. And of course, for society as a whole, we could say that they advance new forms of social organization oriented toward and justified by measurement. So we call the resulting uh, social formation the ordinal society. So again, this is work that I'm doing with Kieran Healy. We're, we're writing a social theory book about you know, the ordinal, you know, this society powered by uh, rationalized measurement systems. So the ordinal society is a society that is built on measurement and ranks. It is a set of institutions that strive to scale and see everyone by way of behavioral data harvested through digital environments. Now the institutions of the, of the ordinal society have two essential characteristics. First, their ambition is exhausted. Everyone must be apprehended through numerical metrics and the categories they represent. Second, they are not merely interested in counting. Numbers are not simply, you know, you know, are not simply a cardinal function, right? But they also have, you know, they are ordering mechanisms. So the ordinal society is really about classifying, sorting, and slotting those who come under its purview. And of course, both markets and states find themselves compelled to build up and exploit this new kind of knowledge, you know, which is efficient and proliferating and fine-grained. Uh, and they do so that in order to manage individual claims on resources and opportunities. Now, of course, none of this is new, right? Efforts to rationalize the process of measuring behavior and sorting people on that basis have a long history. The current growth and deepening reach of automated decision-making recalls in fact earlier forms of scoring by public and private uh, organizations. Uh, for instance, when Max Weber discussed the step-by-step -step distributed and nominally objective procedures that characterize decision-making in modern bureaucracies, he was discussing a form of algorithm. One of Weber's key insights was that capitalist markets and bureaucratic organizations shared an affinity for the systematic application of rules and measures. People and things had to be visible if they were to be acted upon. In the 19th century credit market, for example, uh, American business guides developed methods to identify good credit prospects. They collected, you know, usually by way of uh, people who would go to a city and, and collect gossip, essentially, and, and uh, you know, talk to, um, talk to the population. So they collected various bits of information about the economic reliability of individuals and corporations. Arbitrary as it often was, the use of this data created the impression of precision and order. Organizations got better at it as time went on. The information used to produce the evaluations was gradually standardized. Uh, and you can see here, for instance, in this, um, you know, in this uh, um, scan from the credit guide, you can see examples of how individuals are represented through you know, numbers, letters, and uh, signs. Um, so the, you know, the, the ordinal scheme on the output side was steadily refined, allowing for more categories of creditworthiness. 
around the country, dedicated organizations compiled and circulated local lists of businesses or individuals to subscribers, providing addresses and occupations, along with numerically or pictographically coded information about their qualities as potential debtors. Classes of people, scores, and prices became closely connected. Uh, we have a similar story in life insurance. In the decades leading up to the US Civil War, a few companies in the American South sold a strange product, life insurance contracts on slaves based on simple calculations involving age and skill. And this is the scan that I put on this uh, slide. And this is actually a useful reminder that uh, many of the institutions, co-institutions of American capitalism, you know, were actually born um, uh, at the time of, of slavery. From this reputable business, life insurance was progressively mor moralized to target middle-class households in an age of economic turmoil. Uh, and, um, you know, Viviana Zelizer and Dan Book have, have written that, that story. Practically, the real turning point came in 1903, when a doctor at the New York Life Company started rating medical risks. This made it possible to personalize the price of life and health insurance through the application of a so-called numerical method, method. And then as head of New York's largest life insurance company in the 1920s, the composer Charles Ives made it his business to turn life insurance scoring into an objective scientific operation. Again, an example, but two things are worth mentioning. First, in the process of insuring themselves against risk, people learn to subject themselves to intrusive questioning about their lifestyle, their ancestry, and their health, giving away personal information for the convenience of a loan or the security of insurance became a normal thing. Second, corporations did not serve everyone equally or equally well. For instance, black people were either excluded or burdened with less favorable conditions as did women. But even then, you know, the idea seemed irresistible that more information, more numbers and more science offered a prom promising path to expand the business toward new populations, including populations that were previously deemed unserviceable. And of course, capitalism, let's remember, was flourishing at the time. And the factory too was producing data. In fact, lots of it. Uh, in the 1910s, management pioneers, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, used the best technology then available, film cameras, to observe and record the work process in order to understand and reorganize its component parts. Measurement was not just precise for them, it was as finely focused as possible, much like you know, modern day data. Every detail should be captured and subject to investigation and optimization. And of course, every individual body too. Its performance, both physical and intellectual, could be scored too. So these are just some examples of a general process happening in many domains at once, and you know, which started a long time ago and has you know proceeded apace since um, you know since the period that I uh, reference here, you know, the nineteenth, uh, late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. The outcome of this long historical process is that by the end of the twentieth century, each person could be apprehended through what Oscar Gandhi Jr. calls a profile, a precise set of records in quantifiable form drawn from a wide range of private sources, often supplemented by some nominally public information that used to be inaccessible at large scales, but which computerization made available. Gandhi, originally a specialist of marketing, and is perhaps one of the least well-known but most visionary of American theorists of his generation. As he defined it in the mid 1990s, a prof quote, a profile is primarily a list of categories that have been determined to be relevant to some administrative decision that must be made by an organization with regard to an individual, a group or a class. 
individual categories or variables are the dimensions along which an entity must be evaluated. Subsets of categories may be combined into an index score. The fundamental purpose of a profile is the assignment of an individual into a class or category that represents a decision. This is a process of identification with a consequence. Now, modern digital techniques, of course, work on similar principles. They just use more and more varied data, and the consequences are much more entangled with everyday life. The new profile is much more exhaustive than its predecessors. Its components are processed automatically. It circulates with much greater ease across institutions and um, you know, is matched into gigantic databases. And it can be deployed for a much broader range of purposes. And finally, it is customizable at will, an important point that I shall return to at the end of the talk. In fact, collecting data as a matter of course has become an expected performance, a cultural obligation for most organizations. We could call this a data imperative. This data imperative stems partly from technological convenience, falling costs of storage, uh, software and cloud computing, as well as weak consent laws have pushed organizations of all types to sweep up increasingly large quantities of bits about whatever crosses their path. For a few thousand dollars, any institution with an online presence can deploy a dragnet that collects granular data about people and things. It may do so passively, of course, from bits of information logged by digital devices located on one's person, you know, uh, and uh, also located in the environment, you know, like sensors. Or, of course, it can do so by actively enrolling individuals into the process through digital onboarding, obligatory check-in, rating, etc. Also important uh, to the data imperative, not simply the falling cost, but it, it, uh, it also really important is the institutionalized belief that more data and more technology will result in actionable knowledge. What kind of knowledge for what purpose may not be known? To use uh, Gandhi's phrase again, the desired consequence of the process of identification may not have come into view and in fact does not necessarily need to. Future uses indeed are often unrelated to the reasons why the data was logged in the first place. This is because new computing techniques have the ability to discover patterns and correlations with virtually no pre-established conceptions about the world. And indeed so organizations, both public and private, are not only compelled to seek and demand new kinds of data, but also to mine it in a somewhat agnostic fashion to find relations that stick, or just hold on to it until some you know, use uh, will be discovered in the future. And of course, this can be problematic uh, when systems are, are deployed to identify rare patterns and, you know, um, uh, computer scientists, statisticians, and so on have written eloquently about this. But from the sociological point of view, um, let me now turn um, to the supply side. I guess it's also the economic point of view. We can also understand the data imperative as a supply side mechanism too. To the extent that all essential activities have moved partially online, being a full member of society today implies, not, implies once bit by bit incorporation into the network infrastructure of the in the networked infrastructure of the internet just as co uh, organizations are culturally obligated to collect more and more data people experience the need to produce more and more data about themselves some of this incorporation appears coerced but in many instances it isn't as with the demand side it is obligatory, you know, the date provision of data is obligatory in a cultural sense. Nearly every digital service promises access to new opportunities. So, you know, if you supply data, um, you know, all kinds, you know, many promises might be realized. 
those who have been left behind will be able to train themselves. The financially excluded will muster credit or funding. The jobless will find work. The entrepreneurial will innovate. Minorities will be empowered. Unknown artists and innovators will have a platform to showcase their creativity and so on. In other words, the tech industry's vision of the digital future is that of a gigantic inclusionary machine, a democratizing force, a solution to problems of opportunity and fairness. And in certain important ways, this vision may be correct. But what happens once people have been incorporated into the rationalized measurement systems that go along with these services? So Kieran Lee and I have argued that newly actionable social divisions, newly actionable forms of capital and social duties are being produced. And all of these shape today life's trajectories uh, in multiple ways. And so we move from this data imperative to the question of the stratification that goes along with it. In practice, the main output of rationalized uh, measurement systems is the proliferation of scores and classifications by way of algorithmic data processing, where of course algorithm can be a very simplistic or simple set of instruction, instructions. In the market, the process typically yields some form of social differentiation. You know, people are sorted into essentially kinds and ranks. And you know, they face different terms of service, different prices, and different, maybe a different product menu on the basis of these um, classificatory processes. So you can think of, say, you know, your Netflix uh, categories, for instance. Um, as you know, uh, a, a type of uh, you know uh, categorizing people by by kind, and you can think of, of you know the credit score as uh, you know the way in which people are being um, hierarchized on some you know ordinal scale. Now, scores and rating, of course, are of particular interest to us, especially to you know sociologists because they are about ordering people along some kind of hierarchy. In these systems, social positions are defined in relation to thresholds and cut points on ordinal or cardinal scales. So a good example is, you know, in the credit domain, people may be treated as prime or subprime risks, you know, depending on where they, you know, where they stand in, um, you know, the credit uh, scoring scale. Or you know they may be uh, many you know they may occupy many uh, positions in between. Um, one's job continuation as a platform worker may depend on a proprietary assessment that matches cumulative feedback by clients with other measures of efficiency and profitability for the platform. Now, sociology offers a number of theoretical tools for thinking about the mechanisms by which inequality is produced and maintained. In the next section, I will show how we repurpose these tools to account for the stratifying processes that emerge from the proliferation and deployment of behavioral measurement systems. And so we call this perspective rationalized stratification. Let us begin with a classic concept in the literature on inequality, social class. How may we think about class in the era of behavioral measurement? We can begin with, again, Max Weber, whom I already cited. Weber defines social class as arising when, I quote, a number of people have in common a specific causal component of their life chances. And, you know, in that famous piece in that um, called Class, Statues, and Party, he talks about various ways in which that uh, causal component of life chances might come about. Of course, he thinks about the labor market like, uh, you know, Marxist do, but he thinks about other markets like the credit market, um, for instance, as a site of class formation from this point of view. So, you know, debtors are a class and creditors are a class in Weber's uh, thinking. So unlike Marx, who thought about class in terms of a position or binary, Weber argued that the process of class assignment 
is actually made real by the workings of a rationally organized market. And on every domain, you know, you can have sort of different, um, you know, people can occupy different positions, which together make a much more um, multi-dimensional, um, uh, constitute a multi-dimensional situation for the individual. So we can think of digital classification in, in classifications in exactly the same way. Digital classifications rooted in behavioral measures are one critical causal component of life chances today. In fact, people's situation in various markets increasingly depend on organizational efforts to identify them as members of some category to offer them prices, services, or opportunities on the basis of that membership, and then to reconfigure both the criteria for class membership and often the overall system of categories in the effort to maximize returns from consumers, employees, and users. So on this interpretation, we should be paying attention to the quantified processes through which institutions in each domain of social life, and I've represented a whole bunch of them here, you know, create what we can call classification situations, which is a play on Weber's concept of class situation. We should recognize that these classification situations are increasingly rooted in quantified logics of incremental gradation, as opposed to say, categorical logics of inclusion and exclusion. Again, let me give you the example of credit. You know, you can think about, you know, in the 1960s, 70s, you know, until sort of the uh, anti-discriminatory uh, legislation of the 1970s, you know, uh, credit was primarily, uh, you know, not primarily, but it was uh, importantly given out to people on the basis of some demographic characteristics. So, you know, um, women had to be married in order to be to obtain credit and they couldn't you know they had to have a sort of their husband's signature or you know um, entire neighborhoods were redlined um, and credit couldn't be uh, obtained there um, and of course these red neighborhoods tended to be uh, minority neighborhoods particularly primarily black neighborhoods so the you know essentially the credit market was organized fundamentally around this logic of inclusion exclusion today you know the market is presumably you know uh, anybody can presumably enter the market and so what we have is that we have this sort of fine gradation of positions within it okay so we have this you know quantified logics in and this is happening you know this is developing in increasingly every you know in every market right so these logics are uh, incremental, gradated, they are dynamic. That is, they are constantly readjusting to the institutions, changing objective functions and the incoming data flows. Um, third, we should acknowledge that such classifications increasingly structure broad opportunities and life chances. The likelihood of obtaining or staying in a job, of obtaining credit, of being able to rent an apartment, even being deemed a desirable dating prospect. Uh, and in fact, you know, uh, some um, uh, particularly important measure, again, like the credit score, operate across all of these markets. They are being used not simply in finance, but in housing, in insurance, um, and in fact, in dating, uh, in dating as well. So this is why people care about this, uh, you know, about these measures. They orient themselves toward these systems and they adjust their behavior so they can make it there too. Uh, and you can find lots of examples of how people, you know, try to manage their position. So you can think, you know, about the relentless efforts of those who depend on platform for work to maintain a high rating or to boost their numbers of followers. So you can think about the work of Brooke Duffy on women influencers or the work of Stuart Forrest Stewart uh, on drill art artists. Um, who um, may try to maintain their presence on YouTube. Or you can think about the sprawling uh, credit advice industry that helps people manage and improve their credit score for a fee. And that's a subject that's been studied by Fred Wary. So I think the message that, I, you know, what I'm trying to sort of say here, and I think it's really important, is that classification situations are not merely approximation to pre-existing social groups 
whether you're thinking about pre-existing social groups as races or classes, though, of course, they may overlap substantially in specific cases, and I'll return to that point. But rather, we need to think about these classification situations as independently generated taxonomies and scales that can come to have distinctive and consequential effects on the outcomes that people experience in life. Let me now turn to a second concept, also well known in the literature on social stratification, the concept of capital. Kieran Healy and I argue in a separate paper that we can think of the totality of one's interactions with the digital economy as a metaphor of capital in the sense of Pierre Bourdieu. Now, for those of you who know Bourdieu, you know that you know, conceived in a generic manner, capital is an embodied set of resources that profits is be its bearer. So, um, you know, uh, someone with a lot of economic capital will uh, fit naturally into, you know, the dominant social group, which in this case would be the rich, you know, um, cultural capital, uh, you know, uh, puts you in a uh, in a um, high position, um, you know, relative to uh, uh, another field, which is sort of, you know, the uh, culture and, and your, your position on, on that space. And, you know, you can think of social connections in the same way, social capital, and you can think of also um, and yet another form of capital for Bourdieu, symbolic capital, which is sort of, you know, re references some form of social authority in a particular field. What, you know, for Bourdieu, what's important about capital is that deep early family socialization is the most efficient vehicle for capital's transmission, particularly for those capitals that come in immaterial symbolic forms like cultural capital. Now here we can think again about the digital economy as constituting a new type of capital, right, which overlaps partly with the traditional forms identified by Bourdieu, uh, you know, like social capital or cultural capital, but also departs from them. Unlike cultural capital, this one has a clear materiality. It is accumulated over the long history of a person's recorded, interact uh, recorded actions. It's built up from traces left on everything from social media to credit bureaus to shopping websites, fidelity programs, courthouses, pharmacies, maybe the content of emails and chats. It incorporates social ties you know, which are now measurable, you know, uh, online as for the specific uh, features of one social network. Um, but it also incorporates various uh, ways of appreciating more worth, one's reputation, one's accountability. And most importantly, and that's very um, unique relative to uh, the forms of capital identified by Bourdieu, you know, its digital nature makes it a subject of calculation. Now, it may be a little bit difficult to wrap one's head around the concept, right? Um, fundamentally, this capital should be thought of as a set of vectors in a multidimensional space where each dimension can be measured. To fully grasp, grasp this complex character, we call it eigen capital, where eigen, of course, is a reference to eigen vectors. Um, um, and eigen value means sort of characteristic, right? So it, let me try to explain a bit. If you think of a single row of data that characterizes, for instance, a datafied Marion Fourcade, right? So each column would be a measure of something and collections of column could come from different sources and capture different features of Marion Fourcade and her profile. So the imaginary eigen capital would at the individual level be some way of boiling all of that information down to some reduced characterization of me uh, in terms of a few key measures. What those measures are would vary by the purpose pursued by the organization. Now, of course, in practice, Eigen Capital is a genuine engineering problem uh, that's subject to failure or incomplete realization. And so that's why we have a drive to constantly enhance its materiality and its numerical character, and also to make it more tractable through various techniques of dimensionality reduction. Uh, so from the actual Marion Foucault's point of view, the various scores calculable from this data would inevitably lose detail or be inaccurate in some ways, but they might be good enough 
you know, a good enough summary of, of, of where I fit relative to other people and good enough certainly from the point of view of the score maker. It may be good enough for me too. So at, at, and, and, you know, the most extreme version of this, you know, is this uh, notion that eigen capital can take a very, very reduced form as a single number of rate or rating. So of course, the, the example that comes to mind is China's social credit system, which proposed, of, as you know, to score citizens on a composite index with information derived from a broad range of sources. So that sort of, you know, is perhaps the most um, glaring example of a highly reduced form of, high, uh, of eigen capital, even though it hasn't been fully realized in, in practice. Um, but, you know, less well known is the fact that there are plenty of efforts in the same direction elsewhere. For instance, the company Airbnb has recently filed a patent for a trustworthiness score, which is not unlike some Chinese efforts. According to uh, recent media reports, the system will use artificial intelligence to mark down those found to be associated with fake social network profiles or those who have given any false details. The patent also suggests users are scored poorly if keywords, images, or video associated with them are involved with stripes or alcohol, hate website organizations, or sex work. People involved in pornography or who have authored online content with negative language, which will be also marked down, end uh, quote. What this case describes is a form of eigen capital to be bestowed on people algorithmically and across domains, in a, often in a manner that is opaque to them. Advantage, of course, may accrue to those who accumulate it. You know, the advantage is very clear here. You, know, you get access to certain uh, spaces like Airbnb rentals, better prices, you know, better service, kinder consideration, or standing across domains. So, in fact, what you know the electronic systems are, are doing here is that they are transmitting what in the past were disconnected interactional processes into quantitative quantitative data. And you know, the benefits are, if you will, automatized. You know, people can sort of carry their reputation with them on their phone or in their wallet. Now, of course, to the extent that these kinds of systems work successfully, um, and it is important to bear in mind that getting them to work is a huge challenge, you know, the process actually fades into the background. So, you know, you do not see the bad actors who try to use your card but were automatically denied. You do not have your integrity questioned by a sales clerk or a border patrol agent, you know, you can rent um, um, on Airbnb, you can take an Uber and all of that. The, the system essentially smooths the way, smooths the way uh, by authenticating you and finding appropriate matches for you, uh, you know, including people, products and services. So from this point of view, those who are virtuous and by the system standards experience the outcome as, you know, a sort of uh, uh, well-deserved kind of ease. Um, but those who try to evade being measured and classified, as well as those who perform poorly by, the, by those standards, you know, they might face high costs, they might face undesirable matches, and possibly outright exclusion from uh, services um, and, and platforms uh, themselves. Uh, as an example of this exclusion, you know, um, this week I found myself uh, consenting to Uber's new terms of service that specified any user whose rating falls below a certain threshold can lose access to their account. So we are reintroducing new forms of exclusion, but this time not on the basis of some categorical or demographic characteristics, but on the basis of this sort of gradated measure of worth. So in the case of Uber, you know, the company used to be focused on rating drivers, but it is becoming much more explicit about doing the same for users and then using the ratings of both users and, um, and drivers, you know, to create, to manage order flows and, um, you know, um, uh, and, and uh, so even possibly uh, pricing uh, people accordingly. Final. Um, Example that I wanted to give, final concept, 
uh, is the, you know, uh, one final concept that is, I think, very important for the theorization of inequality. And it's the distribution of public benefits and punishments by way of state institutions. Now, I won't talk about the punishment side of this because, first of all, because it's been extremely well studied by many sociologists and political scientists and, and legal scholars. So I'll focus more on the positive aspects of citizenship, the provision of public goods and supports. So here again, um, you know, um, it is often not well known uh, that modern regimes of, the, uh, of personal data collection have, uh, you know, are partly anchored in the development of what uh, sociologist T.H. Marshall calls social citizenship. It is in fact the expansion of the welfare state that spearheaded government's interest in the constitution of detailed individual records. In the United States, the social security system started maintaining longitudinal files over a person's lifetime. They were essentially employment files. And those, you know, those techniques were, uh, you, know, those you know, those databases were actually modeled after practices that were common in the corporate life insurance industry. Today, personal surveillance inheres in the provision of public supports and algorithms have burrowed their ways into various kinds of social policies, as Virginia Eubanks has described in her remarkable book, Automating Inequality. Public institutions often require intrusive pre-qualifying information. They, they obligate claimants to frequent checks into the system and uh, detailed record, record keeping. They share data across agencies and they repurpose it all to pursue organizational goals, such as cost savings that sometimes may conflict with their public mission. Again, as in the market, digitization has led to the proliferation of quantitative measures and point systems in the management of social citizenship. So just an example, uh, Australia's welfare recipients who quote, fail to meet their required activities which includes a lot of you know, checking in repeatedly into the system, they will receive demerit points that put them at risk of income support suspension. Now, of course, it, what's important is that these functional changes have gone hand in hand with a broader ideological transformation noted by many scholars of social citizenship from an unconditional status motivated by shared fate to a contingent privilege that is now dependent on personal worth and personal worth measured in this very particular way. So we've argued that rationalized measurement systems should be thought of as new and consequential dimensions of social stratification for three reasons. You know, first they shape opportunities within the various domains in which they arise and sometimes in fact across domains. Second, combined all together, these classification situations constitute a new overarching form of capital that represents a general social position that an individual obtains by virtue of their incorporation into the digital economy. And we've seen various efforts, both East and West, to reduce this eigen capital to a number that represents an individual's general trustworthiness. Third, these measures and others like them can also become a linchpin for determining the conditions of citizenship. Now, one important question remains, how do these systems interact with other well-established patterns of inequality? Um, the power uh, that they have is at root their ability to draw on a very large volume of data about the things that people do. So let me take again the credit score as an example. Credit scores are rooted in detailed records about credit behavior. So they are about payment made on time and without exceeding the credit limit. Importantly, scoring agencies use no demographic information in the calculation of credit score. I guess the closest thing to a, a standard demographic variable is the length of credit history, which is a proxy for age. Information about salary, job title, employer, employment history, and place of residence are also excluded from consideration. Interest rates on particular credit cards, child support obligations, rental agreement obligations, all of those are excluded. 
The result is a score that seems stripped of all categorical markers, a pure measure of past behavior predictive of future risk. Behind the veil of categorical differences, occupational status, income or wealth are simply the actions people have taken with whatever money they had. So from this point of view, this personalized scoring system seem, seemingly isolates a pure individual contribution dis disentangled from one's economic situation and social status. The question we may want to ask is, you know, is this kind of disentanglement fully possible? The few empirical studies that have worked with proprietary credit data, the main study was done in 2016 by the Federal Reserve, show that net of all traditional controls, racial differences in credit behavior continue to be large. At practice, and you know, work that Kieran and I have done uh, using um, uh, self-reported credit scores shows that at practically every level of income, non-whites are more likely to pay only uh, the minimum on a credit card bill to pay a late fee and to exceed their limit, their credit limit, than non-whites, again, net of everything else. This results in much lower credit scores on average, everything else being equal. So how should we think about this? Should we think about this as a well-measured but problematic group behavior? Uh, or should we think about it as a result of unmeasurable historical legacies of suffering, exclusion, and socialization, which are now stuffed and rendered invisible through the credit score behavioral channel? Okay, and that's true of every rationalized measurement system. You know, they all presumably face the same problem. The idea of a pure individual behavioral component that is fully extricated from the broader social structure by way of more and more data is fundamentally a mirage and we should recognize it that way. So let me give you three conclusions. I just wanna say, you know, uh, this is a glim um, picture, uh, you know, that picture, but um, I, I just want to say that there are still plenty of advantages to behavioral scores and ratings. They make institutions work faster and more efficiently. They perform a certain idea of objectivity, you know, by being removed from sort of the subjective judgment of the agents that used to make um, decisions. So, and so they depoliticize contentious social processes. But we can pose three questions. The first problem is what I would call uh, the illusion of orderliness, or the problem of, of order, if you will. In the words of Fabien Accominuti, scoring systems benefit from an aura of full precision that conceals the fuzziness, messiness, ambiguity, and multidimensionality of the evidence behind the constructs they claim to measure, end quote. Indeed, scores elevate an ideal of social orderliness, and they sustain the belief that scaling people is a natural and legitimate thing to do. There's a lot of empirical evidence, in fact, some of it from, uh, uh, produced by a community itself, that people are more likely to accept inequality if it relies on artificially sharp and clear-cut measures than other types of comparative assessment. He's done experiments uh, with um, job performance evaluation, and he finds that you know, people don't like scores, but they actually find them uh, you know, they, they are more likely to accept them as sort of, you know, objective, uh, good evaluations of, of, of performance. Hence, one of the most important things about scoring may be quite simply the fact that it forces us to see the social world as a space of commensurability and thus hierarchization. But we may want to ask ourselves the question, you know, how do we sustain beliefs in equality in a system that is obsessed by the measurement of difference? So that's the first question that I'd like to pose, you know, um, the, the, the naturalization of the idea that we have to hierarchize people. The second problem uh, is what I would call the problem of merit. The behaviorism embedded in rationalized measurement systems also has a moral dimension. 
By appearing as records of prior actions and decisions, scores seem to imply that anyone who apply themselves, applies themselves can do well. And that, as I showed with the example of uh, credit score, um, um, you know, racial differences in the credit score, that obfuscates the broader social forces that actually shape the very context in which individual actions take place. Positions in these systems are experienced as morally deserved. The competitive outcome of prior good or bad individual actions and decisions are worse uh, the outcome of some innate character. This idea that, you know, the idea that behavioral scores legitimate the social order by producing scales of deservingness is, of course, an old critique. And you can find it, you know, just, um, it's, a, it's a critique that sociologists have waged on, on grading systems in education for a very long time. But perhaps we need to revive it for today's world. So my second question is this, you know, if unequal outcomes are deemed to be just, how do we maintain meaningful forms of solidarity? My final problem is the problem of value. We must consider the fact that much algorithmic sorting is oriented to the needs of specific organizational objectives. This is why, for instance, there isn't just one credit score, but thousands, each precisely tailored to the particular economic purpose it is meant to serve. You know, this is why many ordinal systems, for instance, rating systems for online labor platforms, um, tend to reward better people who produce value for them. That is people who, not necessarily people who do jobs well, but people who take more jobs, who work longer hours for the platform and so on and so forth. The same data that powers evaluations of relative merit also serves to optimize on market value. At its worst, you know, this may mean evaluating someone's likelihood of being tempted uh, by a particularly rotten deal, their willingness to accept a particularly low salary, the risk that they will leave the company or, be or will become a burden on social services. But even at its best, you know, this system may mean that people's movements up and down some ordinal scale may have actually little to do with their own actions and everything to do with changing system rules and incentives, the changing objectives that an organization wants to achieve. So to sum that idea, you know, ordinal stratifications are actually culturally powered and naturalized by ideologies of merit. You know, it's as if, you know, people believe the performance is about them, but materially, in fact, they are anchored by considerations of market value. Uh, so there's a disconnect here. So I will leave you with my third question, and that's the last one, and I'll finish after that. If merit is just a smoke screen for the market, why should we care? Okay, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much for listening to me. Marion, thank you so much. That was really wonderful. So, so thought provoking. Um, and let's see, I'll encourage uh, many people feel comfortable turn on your camera so that we can uh, see each other for this last session of the semester. Uh, thank you so much and um, ready to take questions. All right, Anita, I'll go to Anita and then Ashmi shall come to you. Thank you for this fascinating talk. You know, um, it's not often that we think in a historical context about the long path that we've been on about ordinal representations and differences and so on. Can you say a little bit about the interdisciplinarity of this research and just your experiences perhaps in engaging with um, you know, scholars of AI and data scientists who may not often think this way? What are some of the challenges that you faced and, and how can we engage in a conversation, you know, uh, in, in uh, together in light of the research you've presented? Thanks, that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, I, I think um, I, I am, you know, this is where I'm actually proudly a sociologist here because I think we have something to bring to this conversation. I mean, the conversation, 
um, around AI has been often, it, and it's a very important conversation, but it's been often focused on sort of the legal exposure, you know, um, so questions of especially algorithmic discrimination had been front and center in that literature. And we actually have, you know, uh, several associations that are almost devoted entirely to this question, right? And I understand um, the urge, I also understand the incentives for a company to want the, you know, those questions tackled. But I think we have to think much more broadly about um, the ways in which, you know, these very fundamental processes of stratification. And in the book, we actually look also at the processes of group making. You know, sociology is basically the study of how groups are made and how social hierarchies are made, right? So we need to understand how, um, how these two fundamental processes of social ordering, there's no society that is not ordered in some way, right? So the question is how the, do the technologies, you know, shape these uh, processes of ordering? And that's a much, much bigger question, I think, than the questions of whether the systems sort of reproduce certain kinds of prejudice and so on and so forth. I mean, we, we want to see um, the processes that are native to these technologies and that are reordering the world in a way that are new. And so the, I think saying that, as, as we often hear, that these processes are reproducing or entrenching or extending, say, racial inequality or gender inequality, I think it is a cheapening of the things that are going on. You know, we are creating new classes of people. We are creating new ways, you know, new meritocracies, right? We are creating new ways of thinking about social difference. And that's what I, you know, uh, that's what I think sociology is bringing to that conversation. Um, in my work, I, um, I, I use, uh, I, you know, I, I take things from everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's, it, you know, history is very important. So I've gone back to uh, similar kinds of systems historically. So I've read, you know, one of the book that, um, that you know influenced me a lot is, is you know uh, John Carson's book uh, on the measure of merit which is about sort of IQ you know in the early 20th century you know he, all of these are really important because fundamentally what we are doing with these systems is not very different from sort of the measurement of IQ at the beginning of the 20th century I mean they, you know this we are trying to achieve the same thing you know um, and so, you know, it's important to engage with that earlier literature. It's important to recognize that none of this system is, you know, that at least the urge is not new. The technologies are, but the urge is not new. And the urge has a very long history and it is the history of all societies to sort of rank and sort people. Um, yeah, so yes, I try to, yeah, I, I, I think of my work as, as being very, uh, very interdisciplinary, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Marianne, well, thanks, thanks, Anita, Ushmish. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the politics that go behind creation of the classification systems. So I'm thinking of the, book sorting things out by Boker and Lee Starr um, and how at the point of use, we think of classification systems and as being objective, but on closer examination, the process of creating them is much more subjective. Yeah, so I think it's, I mean, this is a really um, interesting uh, aspect. So on some level, you know, one, Problem. So the question is you know, uh, how the politics is a, might be embedded in sort of the design of the systems themselves, and then of course in their consequences. And those are not necessarily the same thing. But you know, relative to the design, of course, one of the one of the reasons why these uh, instruments are sort of depoliticizing is partly because they are so opaque. Uh, it is very. It is often very difficult to sort of understand the specific components of an algorithm for especially those who that have uh, that are um, uh, 
um, uh, produced by private companies, you know, they are typically trade secrets. And so, you know, you, there's no uh, um, legibility, but even especially as we move to sort of new, towards newer methods of machine learning, um, you know, uh, it becomes even, you know, these systems are not necessarily very legible to the people who have designed them. Um, so, you know, it becomes really, uh, really difficult to understand where they, you know, where they come from. And that's part of the politics. In fact, there was a case, I believe, um, in Houston, Texas, where um, teachers complained about um, the algorithm that was calculating their performance um, and uh, on which their pay depended. And they won you know, the case uh, on the grounds that, you know, this kind of um, measure doesn't, you know, doesn't give them enough, um, um, you know, uh, due process, if you will. Um, so, and you've, we've seen also say the British student, you know, demonstrate against the algorithms that rated them um, uh, during the pandemic, you know, and the, the exams couldn't take place. And so they, you know, the students were assigned a, you know, a grade for the A levels or O level. I, for, I always forget which one it is um, for the for the national exam, and um, you know, and they complained because it was again, you know, um, um, you know, the, the fact that it is happening from the point of view of this algorithm, um, in which they have very little, for which they have very little legibility, is is problematic. So there's that. You know, that's a big part of the. Um, of the of the politics of classification, um, but you know we we rarely sort of go back to ask ourselves, um, you know, what goes into, especially in the world of big data, when we have uh, the possibility of incorporating. I mean, you heard what I mentioned about the trustworthiness score, you know, patent, the, the, you know, just uh, filed by Airbnb, right? So, you know, pictures and, you know, words that people put and, uh, you know, um, purchases and stuff like that, you know, you, all of this can be aggregated. And so with, you know, this kind of, you know, we, um, and there is, again, um, uh, uh, we've reached a point where um, the data is so plentiful uh, that we, you know, we have these systems that that sort of lose uh, uh, all uh, manner of um, uh, democratic uh, accountability, and I think that's, you know, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the big problems that we are facing today. And so the politics has tended to be very much on, you know, refusing the algorithm altogether. So that's the British solution. That was the, you know, the Houston teacher solution is that, you know, we don't want the system at all. Um, precisely because it's not like, you know, in some of the systems described by Boker and Starr or by um, SP Land and Souder, where, you know, you can complain, you can say, well, maybe this category shouldn't be there, or, you know, you cannot try to adjust your performance on some parts of the index, you know, as we grow to our systems that are incorporate data from a very wide range of sources and, um, uh, and also, you know, much, much larger uh, range and much, much larger number of sources, you know, um, it becomes increasingly hard to contest, you know, the contribution of any one piece of it to the, you know, to the broader rating system. Great. Thanks, Marianne. Thanks, Ishtiak. Thanks. Hey, uh, Marianne, wonderful talk. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, it's really thought provoking. And I was like often like nodding my head and saying that, yes, yes, that's true. So thank you for, for sharing um, your work. It's a fascinating work. I wanted to, uh, you know, like I know your thoughts about a couple of things very much related to the ordinal society that you were, uh, you were seeing, uh, which are coming through these applications of this algorithm. One thing is definitely, and which you also hinted a bit, is uh, uh, is the breakdown of this technology. So, so uh, 
uh, this algorithmic systems like uh, starting from social media, credit system, uh, these systems are often imposed on people, but we are also seeing that there are protests, people are throwing them away. You just mentioned the example of UK educational algorithm system that people, you know, like um, uh, thwarting. So my question is, where do you put like a people's, like a general people's agency or general people's, uh, you know, like a power to fight against this ordinal, you know, structure that is being imposed on them? Because, uh, you know, like a, from, uh, from what I, you know, like a got from your talk is that this is kind of unavoidable, you know, like a future that we are heading toward. But in the ground, we are also seeing that people are continuously refusing this uh, from here and there. So where do you practically see the future of this technological advancement? Well, I mean, I think I, I tried to make it clear in the, in the talk that, you know, yes, in part, some of these systems are imposed. And, you know, you can think of, you know, everything having to do with sort of criminal surveillance and, you know, credit surveillance and all of that. I, you know, largely people don't, you know, if I use my credit card, I, I don't get a choice. My, you know, the transaction is being recorded. But a lot of it is, you know, actually people uh, <laughs> wanting to be part of something. And, you know, I've, I've, writ, I've written another, you know, a separate paper which sort of um, uh, tries to show, you know, um, the relevance of and the way in which this particular capitalism, digital capitalism works and it essentially it advances through a form of sort of gift making right so Google puts out there, you know, Gmail or, you know, um, Google Maps uh, into the world right and of course you want you know and it's free and so you know and Facebook's the same and you know, so of course you're going to want you know, to be part of it, you want to be, you know, it's, 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 so it's, you know, there's a certain irresistibility to this. Um, and then once you are, you know, uh, once you are part of that world, you know, what, you know, who you are and what you, you know, and what you can do really depends, of course, on your continuous engagement, right? So, um, Certainly, it's true for the you know working platforms like uh, you know uh, Amazon Turk or whatever, right? But it's 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 but it's also true of social media. So you know, my visibility to others depends on me interacting with them through the tools that is that are provided by the system. So there is, you know, there is a real. I mean, I think the strengths and the irresistibility of of this system really really you know draws from sort of human sociality right uh human desires to be part of something to be you know to interact with others um and so on and of course you know this fires back in 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 you know in many ways and this we've seen with facebook and all of that right because you know you're trying to capitalize on human sociality but human sociality is really a dragon and it's 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 you know um, and it's, it's, you know, it's very difficult to actually ride that dragon, right? Um, but, but I, you know, I think um, sometimes people will tell me, well, you're describing a future where it is unavoidable. And I think, um, I don't want to say only that, you know, I try to explain that there are, you know, there are certain kinds of systems that people you know, reject and, you know, uh, they, or there are people who want to be altogether completely out of the grid, you know, these situations, but there is a real sort of um, social drive to this. And, and, you know, and this is really, actually it's a very sociological topic because it's really based on this network effect in the sort of power of, of uh, you know, human sociality uh, to, um, you know, um, to bring everybody, you know, into its fold. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what's inevitable about this, you know, is it has, a, there's a real social dynamics that we cannot afford to ignore. So, so thanks, uh, Maria. That's also like a really, really good answer. Uh, if I, you know, like I can add a follow-up question to that. So the reason I ask this question is oftentimes, 
that rejection creates another kind of technology. So it's not, not only like technology is creating this order, but this order is creating further technologies too. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. where it's a more yeah. like a agnostic tension, so, you know, like a field of contestation that yeah. comes to the place. Uh, mm -hmm. so because a lot of like a, you know, bottom up technologies that we are also seeing. So there is this technology for, you know, tracking the speed of the car. And then the cars are also coming up with technologies, how to dodge these radars. Yeah. And so the, if you think about this, the second kind of technologies, which are coming in response to the, you know, like a top down technologies, these are also ordinal if you just mm -hmm rely on the definition, but they are ordering the society in a particularly different way and in response to the, you know, like a first ordering. And that's where, you know, like a, my, you know, like questions got a bit, you know, like a complicated. Is this like a all, you know, like a, a fight among different orders or yeah. is it like a very yeah. one dimensional? Yeah, so you do have, so of course, you know, um, one of the main things that these systems have done is, uh, you know, they have prompted the emergence of a whole industry to try to gain, <laughs> to, to gain them, right? So, you know, so you can think of, you know, everything from search engine optimization systems to like agencies that help you manage your posting on Instagram, right? And you pay for a service, uh, you know, so you have, you have all of that. So that's partly the, you know, in reaction, to that, right? So whenever the, you, there's this famous, as you know, um, saying in, um, you know, that um, I think Marilyn Strathon cites it, but it's not from her, you know, um, when, a, um, when a matrix uh, ceases to be, now when, um, when a metric becomes a target, it ceases to yes. be a good, a good measure, right? Um, so, you know, so you have indeed, you know, and, and sometimes actually you have the people who are actually okay. doing the metrics, selling the services right. to game it, right? So, uh, yes. so that, that's very common. We've, we've seen that, for instance, with higher education metrics. The time higher education supplement ranks universities, but then it's also selling consulting services on how to sort of do better on the metric, yeah. right? Um, so you have that. And I think, so that's one reaction. Uh, another reaction that we've seen, of course, is, is everything that's happening around crypto. Yeah, it's good arts law. Um, I see that in the chat, you, you quit that. But it's actually, an, an, uh, yeah, not good arts. It's, it comes from like even earlier. Um, um, what did I was say? Yeah. So the, the the other thing is what's happening right now around crypto, right? Where 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 you know there's a sort of a, um, uh, and I don't know this very well, well yet. I'm I'm hoping to educate myself a bit. But you know, sort of this this demand for uh, you know uh, um, some form of um, um, self sovereign identity, where you know all the measures, are, you know everything about yourself becomes sort of accumulated uh, and, and uh, in a decentralized manner and held by you, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, it will still have this function of facilitating, you know, your movement across both the online space and the offline spaces, but, you know, uh, the data will be, you know, will be produced in a very different manner. So yes, you, you're absolutely correct. You know, part of what we, you know, part of the explosion of crypto is a reaction against you know, um, um, you know the the, the perceived uh, abuses of the monopolistic um, uh, structure that we have today in sort of the production of personal data. Yeah, not monopolistic, but quasi-monopolistic. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great answer. Great. Thanks. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here. I have um, so much to to follow up on this. Uh, Marion, first of all, I'm so happy to hear you doing theory around this um, and, and sort of grand theory, because um, uh, I think that's really critical. I, I think, uh, you know, we really need to be lifting our eyes to the horizon of what, what the implications are for large scale, you know, social structure and in that context of the evolution of, of human societies. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is that, um, so the concept of, of 
groups here and classification, mm -hmm. um, given that part of what our algorithms are driving at with massive scale is personalization. Mm -hmm. um, so Facebook has a detailed, extremely rich uh, personal profile. Mm -hmm. um, and, a, a, and a lot of our data now, so like per, personalized medicine, per, you know, it, it's that we don't actually rely on what we could think of as kind of a computational uh, cheat that, that humans have had to use with organization into groups so that we can, you know, we can, we can order our relationships much more easily because all we need to know is male, female, right? Um, lives on this street, earns this kind of income, has that labor, sort of like the, the, the system that you showed in the credit guide, which I, I really wanted to know what all those things uh, stood for, those, those symbols, I'm sure you know. Um, but, but anyway, sort of, so I'm, I'm feeling some tension between the idea that we are classifying when so much of the conversation is around personalization and at an extreme, Right, we could say actually all of our decision making is not classification at all. It's you, and we've been able to train. If, if we imagine a world of you know where we're able to train on all the data, of course we're not going to get there. We have structure in the data um, that it would be. I'm trying to predict the likelihood that you will pay back your loan, and I base that on everything about you. And I haven't actually classified you. I've you know, I and, and I've I've learned now. Anyway, so I'm just curious about certainly the conversation is around highly personalized, and that the capac the computational capacity that we are facing is very different from the world in which we had to classify into groups. So I just you could talk about that a little. Yeah, I think this is really uh, it's something that I. I've been I've been uh, struggling with myself. So you know you you have the perfect uh, question here. Um, so and and it might be useful to sort of um, establish the difference between what I call nominal system, you know, nomi uh, sort of the nominal drive and the ordinal drive. The ordinal drive is about indeed, it's not about classifying. It's a it's about scoring you on some scale, and then on the basis of that score, deciding you know. Do you belong in the, you know, I don't know, in the three percent interest rate, you know, loan or in the, you know, three point five or you know, so um, so there is you know this process of classification, but it's it's on the basis of those sort of this ordinal scale, right? Um, if we think about sort of personalization here, you're thinking more of a system of sort of matching right a person to say a product right so or or um uh, two persons who have sort of similar um uh, taste in movies or something right but you are what you're really trying to do is like figure out me and so all you know at bottom you could possibly get into you know a situation where each of us is in a category of one right but that doesn't mean that the fundamental logic by which you arrive at this is not a classificatory logic in the sense that, you know, all of these movies that I'm watching are classified, right? They are classified as rom-coms or, uh, you know, action or thriller or whatnot. And so, you know, the categorization of me is based on sort of this, um, mountains of categories that we're used to, you know, to produce this, right? So sort of it's classification of the way down, if you will. So we have that, right? Um, um, I think when we're moving to sort of the world of machine learning where the, you know, I don't know, um, uh, the categories are much more emergent you know, from the system, I think your critique becomes much more, you know, much more valid and it becomes harder to think about it in terms of, you know, um, uh, classificatory schemes. Um, but I don't have yet the vocabulary for that. Uh, right yeah, now, we're still safely in the world where Netflix has what, you know, I yeah, think Facebook yeah. has like 
thousands of category, you know, categories in which, but there's still categories, right? Netflix has like, I don't know, 4,000 categories of movies and, you know, um, so, but there's still categories, right? Um, right, right, right. I, I guess I'm thinking that, you know, as we get more and more powerful machine learning systems with massive scale, it's, we don't, it, it, humans are using categories, rom-com, yeah, exactly. thriller, elite, you know, whatever, cerebral, yeah. um, but, you know, what's inside the Netflix algorithm is, you know, a, uh, a vector yeah. of, you know, perhaps huge number, massive number of, of, of elements that for every individual film, and that's what's being predicted, yeah. you know, yeah. for, for any of it. So I guess I'm, I'm, which also sort of gets me thinking about sort of the, the press on explainable AI. It's like, okay, do we have to reintroduce yeah, category. Yeah, I actually. Yeah, that's the debate. Have to, yeah, yeah. So I think that's um, and and I, I want to get to Avery's uh, question because I know it'll be an excellent one. But we, <laughs> you and I, I'd love to have a follow up conversation about your your point that all societies are ordered because I think of you know very earliest human societies highly transparent and actually radically, in many cases, radically egalitarian with a lot of effort devoted to that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that's something to also think about, you know, here, here we are sort of heading out to perhaps these worlds of, in some ways, radical transparency, maybe not, the data is so much greater, but um, uh, a, a follow on conversation that we could perhaps uh, get to. But let me, let me go to Avery's question. You're on mute, Avery. Thanks, sorry. Uh, thanks so much for this talk. I, I absolutely loved everything you had to say. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm asking this question as someone who's currently being scored by the Canadian government in order to immigrate. And it's very interesting to get my actual score, you know, and which languages do I speak and what are the points I get for those languages? And, you know, so <laughs> it's, it's near to my lived existence, uh, this talk. Uh, and I guess that's sort of where my, my question is coming from. So, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, what are your thoughts, given this kind of actuarial vision of the ordinal society and uh, that you've outlined for us, how do you see this playing out in the neoliberal space that's beyond the nation state? And so here I'm thinking about like Iwa Ong's work uh, in the early 2000s, where uh, she demonstrated that the kind of flexible, fluid, neoliberal concept of citizenship was re over prioritizing entrepreneurial categories of the self, um, everything you were really talking about mm -hmm. here. And, and her prediction, and I'm, I'm sure you actually, um, she may be your colleague actually. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. So, but, but she predicts that, you know, oh, well, the nation state will sort of cease to be relevant. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what you think. I'm wondering, do you think that um, this kind of eigenvector selfhood that you've described here, will continue to make irrelevant the form of the nation state or something else. And I, um, I'm partly asking that because you also brought up the PRC's social credit system. Mm -hmm. and I'm kind of wondering if you're seeing that the nation state has realized, oh, wow, you know, there's something really intensely powerful or biopowerful, <laughs> the biopolitics of this are really intense. And in fact, this, this is all moving towards um, certain data sets and vectors that are not shared that that don't like basically not all of these data sets sets are being shared in between the parties right they're like the corporate data sets airbnb um but then there's the nsa's data sets so i don't know what what do you see about that about that landscape and and where this is going great question again um yeah, and so uh, so and and actually, there's a there's a number of people who have written about this, um, and actually, I've, I'm I'm addressing some of these issues that you're mentioning in the that that paper called Ordinal Citizenship, which is exactly about that 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 question. Um, one of the um, there's a um, sociologist uh, named John Chenelli Paul who has written a you know a wonderful book called We Are Data, but he uh, also has a, a chapter in the book and also a, a, a paper that looks at some of the revelations that came out of the Snowden files, where that the um, the NSA in the United States, um, you know how the 
the federal government, you know, cannot pry on, you know, cannot spy on American citizens. But the question is, you know, with these new digital tools and, you know, you have all of this flow of data coming in and out on mm. people. The question is, you know, if you want to comply with the law, you have to be able to determine who's a citizen and who's not. And um, of course, you know, the NS, you, know, you don't have everybody's passport, you know, on hand necessarily when you get a piece of data. So how do you do that? And so the, the NSA had developed a method where they were um, um, essentially rating you in terms of your foreignness. Uh, so if you visited a lot of uh, foreign websites, uh, if you uh, used another language than English, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, up to a certain level. So, at, you know, if you cross a threshold of 51%, you know, then you were deemed a foreigner and therefore you could be surveilled. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so that suggests that, you know, indeed the category of, you know, national citizenship is sort of eroding. Another uh, data point is um, there was, a, it didn't uh, come to pass, but there was, um, um, a proposal by the Trump administration uh, to incorporate credit scores in uh, sort of attributions to uh, of uh, I think it was green cards uh, and citizenship. Um, so you know you come into the United States, you're using credit. Uh, if you're using it well, then you know you might actually apply for a green card, or you know, uh, and you might get citizenship. Again, you know it it, uh, it means that essentially it is the more worth of the person that sort of determines their, um, uh, uh, you know, whether they are desirable uh, as a citizen of a particular uh, polity. Um, and of course, that goes well with a sort of a neoliberal uh, order in which actually having credit cards is, you know, is necessary. You know, you, can, you cannot exist outside of the market, you know. Uh, and now, you know, these, exactly. So these systems haven't yet, you know, so that, 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 you know, that, that was a proposition. It didn't, you know, it was not implemented, but, you know, it's not very impossible, you know, it's not very unlikely that it, we won't go there, right? And there's, a, there's similar proposals actually in the UK uh, and so on. Um, so yes, immigration scholars are increasingly paying attention to all of these tools because they are seeing them as sort of a, a completely new way of thinking about national citizenship, not simply social citizenship I've, as I've pre presented in the, in the talk, but you know, this sort of, uh, you know, yeah, the question of the, you know, it's not your nation state that actually matters anymore. It's, you know, your, your moral worth, yeah. Right, thank you, that was, that was very interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe just with, with a couple of minutes left, Marion, maybe, maybe I can uh, circle back to, yeah, to sure. my question about your, 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 your statement that um, all human societies have been ordered. Um, uh, and so I'm wondering how you think about, um, yeah, earliest human societies and, and egalitarianism. Well, and when I say ordered, it doesn't mean necessarily non-egalitarian. It means, um, you know, it could mean ordered in a sort of us versus them. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, you have, my, you know, my tribe and your tribe, and, you know, you can think also of that as being a very powerful form of ordering. Um, so ordering is not necessarily, is not, well, you're right that order in the sense of ordinality yeah. is the sort of the scaling of hierarchies, but there's also another form of, of uh, you know, social division that is relevant and it's a division between, you know, um, uh, in terms of similarity and difference, you know, who is like me and who is not like me and, you know, uh, one... So I don't know very much the literature on, a yeah. sort of, you know, um, um, early or, or, or less developed societies. I mean, I know there's a, are you thinking of sort of um, Ernst Fair and, uh, you know, the work on, on market and cooperation? And, uh... No, I, I'm actually, th I'm thinking about sort of the anthropological literature okay. on sort of hunter-gatherer societies. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, the, and this is like Christopher Baum and so on. on okay. You know, very, very um, you know, 
radical and radically egalitarian in a, in a sense of you know pulling down the tall poppy right sort of yeah, yeah. you know even if you are the great warrior you're you, you yeah. you're not you shouldn't you shouldn't behave in a way that that suggests that you are entitled to more yeah. although even as i'm saying this i'm also thinking about gender because of course the gender distinction is gender. also is there from from the start but but not but but you know we do, I, at least i think this is a a conclusion from that literature that we don't see the kind of stratification uh, yes we have in group yes. and out group and that but we don't see the stratification um and i guess i'm just thinking because i'm so intrigued by your thinking about you know where we're headed like i, I don't think the answer is we can just say well we'll stop datifying everything we're like yeah. we're, uh, sorry that's the path yeah, we're that's, on that, that, we're, that's, we're, that ship has sailed yeah i agree yeah yeah so, so we have to be thinking about how do we reconstruct our social relations around this uh so that it is not exploitation so it's not oppression so um yeah. and, and and our concepts of equality i think that's why i'm interested in the personalization point because yeah. in some ways the idea of individualized justice is an ideal of course it is of course it is right yeah. right yeah but, but at the same time yeah anyway so yeah that's so i mean one of the you, you know the first of the three conclusions is sort of trying to get at that point um because I'm I'm always a, a a little puzzled by the fact that we are always trying to think um, how can we make our algorithms better, but you know maybe we should also think um, how can we create a world in which algorithms are not necessary that is in which sorting and differentiating people and scaling people is not necessary and you know there's plenty of domains in which we could do that that doesn't mean we could do that everywhere you know i, I understand the need for of an insurance company uh, to do certain things or um uh, credit you know a bank or um but um you know if you think of you so so if we ask ourselves a question of the algorithms, we are not asking ourselves that fundamental question of sort of the, the you know, are, are right. our institutions sufficiently egalitarian? The example that I give is, you know, um, Virginia Eubanks in her book, you know, she has this example of, of um, you know, access to uh, Medicaid. And, you know, they have, in, I think it's, I forget where it is, I think it's in Indiana, they have this really complex eligibility system managed by an algorithm. And, um, you know, well, you wouldn't need that if everybody had healthcare, you know, <laughs> right, you see right, what I mean? Exactly. So, yes, so yep, at, yep, at a yep. certain level, you know, there, there, is, there is a question yep. of what, what are the institutions prior to the algorithms that we are building, right. um, you know, do they, you know, the algorithms are there because right. we, have, we don't right. have the, the right institutions. And I think it's right. true for certain other forms of insurance. I think it's true, you know, so there's there's lots of things that a welfare state can do, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that's, I, I, so I, I'm not that's, sure if I'm answering your question, but I, I think no. it gets at that point of, you know, the yeah, need for wonderful. more egalitarian social, you know, social institutions. Um, Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Marion. That was a fantastic talk to uh, wind up our, seminar series uh, this year. Uh, thank you to all of you for participating throughout the year and, and for being here today. Uh, we'll be back in the fall in 2022, uh, probably in person, but I think we're going to have to have a hybrid option for so we can keep our community uh, widespread. Um, reminder for folks that we're having our absolutely interdisciplinary conference uh, in June. Uh, June 20th, 22nd, including the uh, graduate workshop. Please join us for that. You can find the information on our website um, and we'll look forward to seeing you then and in the future. Thanks everybody. Take care.